Well, welcome to Comp 422 and Comp 620, Information Privacy and Security. Uh, today we are today we are talking about get there. Maybe we'll talk about yes, privacy, but uh, personal privacy. Uh, our schedule coming up. You are here, of course. We are talking about uh, privacy issues. It's Wednesday, November 12. On Monday, we'll talk about the impact of artificial intelligence on cybersecurity. I made that up in the beginning of the semester because it seemed like everybody was doing stuff with artificial intelligence, and I thought I should address that. Now, it turns out there's nothing in the text, and I haven't <laughs> been unable to find an awful lot of that, but we will talk about the impact of artificial intelligence on cybersecurity on Monday. Reminder that is an online only class. It, you can watch via Zoom. You can watch uh, on YouTube, but it will not be in Gram 208 on Monday. Again, a week from tomorrow is Thanksgiving. So a week from today, there are no classes at A&T. Uh, two weeks from today, the third exam will be held. It'll be, again, that will be an online only all day exam as the other two have been. This is the third out of three semester exams and there'll be a final exam. Uh, after the third exam on the Monday that follows that December, whatever, I will hand back your, uh, oh, I'll hand back the exam papers, but I will, somewhere before the start of class, I will be emailing everybody a summary of the grades as I did after the last exam. And so you'll know how you're doing coming up to the final. There is another assignment in this class. It has been posted on Blackboard. Uh, it is due a week from Monday. So you have uh, until Monday and then a whole week. You really don't have to do it over Thanksgiving. You have plenty of time to do it before or after Thanksgiving. It's only three questions, so it's not that difficult. Okay, let's talk a little bit about privacy. There is lots of information being collected every day, all the time out there. Uh, and it's necessary to keep things running. People look at this information to make decisions. Uh, there's a huge amount. Let me cover that in just a minute. Uh, <coughs> uh, of the volume of data, of the number of bytes collected every day, a whole lot of is video. Well, I'm collecting a video right now on each uh, lecture. It seems to take about 200 megabytes of space, which is then uploaded to YouTube. And they convert it to another format. I don't know how much space it takes there, but a lot of, the, a lot of space. 200 megabytes is more than the slides by quite a bit. Uh, Google, Google processes 20 petabytes of data every day. That's a lot of data. Uh, Three hundred and a half million emails and 5 billion searches on Google every day. Every day, That's a lot. I got all this data from Google, so that's I'm sure when they say 5 billion searches, that means 5 billion searches on Google. I don't think they count being. But yes, that's a lot of information going on. This is a chart I found out there from exploding topics that shows an incre exponential increase in the uh, amount of data generated annually. We're getting a huge one. So again, about 130, uh, was that petabyte? No, zettabytes. Zettabytes every day. If you remember, zettabytes is two to the 21st, I believe. Yes, two to the 21st. So that's a big number. I'm, this curve looks so nice and smooth. And every time I see a nice and smooth curve, I'm very suspicious because most things in the world do not run nice smooth curves. There's jaggers, there's ups and downs for this and that. So I don't believe this curve, but I think it's Probably, yes, increasing. Now, there are many reasons for people to collect data. Companies want to make informed decisions. By collecting a lot of data, they can decide that, yes, this is a good policy, or they can measure something that they've done. If they make a change, then you can measure it and see, was it an effective change? Without the data, you're shooting blind. In the business world, you have to collect data to measure things in order to make valuable decisions. Also, companies want to be able to identify potential customers, uh, develop accurate theories, uh, identify problems. Part of collecting data is to see is thing, are things working or are they not working? 
They want to know what customers are doing. They collect data about how customers are reacting. Uh, again, this is part of, also part of predicting future trends. What are people doing? What is likely to occur in the future? If this is increasing, can we expect it to increase? And at what rate? And make a good estimate of where things will be in the short period. So they collect a lot of data. So they're collecting a lot of data and they're collecting data on you. Privacy is confidentiality. Remember the CIA of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. We're talking about confidentiality now. Most people do not want everything in their life to be out there available on the web. Sure, everybody has something you'd rather not have published on the web. But even though we don't want everything out there on the web, we often relinquish certain aspects of our privacy for our convenience because companies demand it. And if they don't, if we don't give them certain information, they won't do what we want. So we're kind of stuck between doing that. Earlier in the semester, I mentioned that the Samsung uh, end user license agreement, they have a section on privacy as almost all companies required to have something on privacy. Well, they have a, a statement on privacy. It's really a statement on no privacy. They collect everything they want. And if you don't like it, you don't have to use their phone. You can analyze the uh, information you collect in the web in a global uh, confidential manner. You can do it without disrupting individuals' privacy. There's a statement here on the National Strategy to Advance Privacy Preserving Data Sharing Analytics, PPDSA, uh, that I found on the White House, uh, whitehouse.gov website. Uh, and they talk about it. They have a, they have a big report, it goes on for. 45 pages, I think. It's not real exciting reading, but they talk about how you can use privacy enhancing technologies to review the data without releasing individual information. That's all well and good, but that's not what companies want to do. Companies want to know about you, not just the general, oh, people are going in this direction, which they also want. They want to know uh, the general, a trend of the population as whole to make big plans, but they also want to know about you. They want to know what do you buy because they might want to sell you one of those things. If you're out look shopping for a widget, particularly if you have to go out and look at a widget on some uh, website, online merchant, but you don't buy the widget. Oh, you're going to see widgets on every website you go to because somebody knows that you're looking for widgets. But they also, of course, keep track of what websites you visit, where where did you go? And also the physical places that you go to, where geographically are you roaming? We talked a little bit about online advertising previously. Yes, the advertisers put advertisements on the uh, ad network and the ad network then gives it out to publishers. Publishers being companies that own websites that want to put or are willing to put advertisement on it. And I'm sure you've been to some of these websites that 90% of the screen space is advertisement. My wife visits them all the time. And so these companies are getting paid to display. They are getting paid some either by displaying the ads or because you clicked on the ads, there's a pay-per-click, pay-per-display, or paper results. If you click on it and buy something, yes, they get paid. So the advertisers are paid. And it's these ad networks direct those advertisements to people they believe are most likely to want to purchase that. Because there's certainly lots of things that I have absolutely no interest in buying. And it would be foolish for an advertiser to pay to put those in front of me because I'm not going to buy them. And so the ad networks work very carefully to make sure that they know what you want. So they're collecting information about you, buying information about you, collecting information about you so that they can direct their advertisements to the proper publishers because they usually get paid again on results, on either the clicks or under the purchases. So they want to make sure they put those ads out where someone's going to click on them. Whereas they don't want to sell me something or advertise something I'm not going to buy because they're wasting space on the screen that's not going to be productive. 
course, privacy depends on culture, depends on uh, individuals. Each person has an individual right to privacy. Here's a definition from Wikipedia. Uh, privacy is the ability of an individual or group to seclude themselves or information about themselves and therefore, thereby reveal themselves selectively. That's a pretty nice definition. You want to only reveal that information that you wish to reveal and not let everybody know everything. What your expectation of that differs per, from person to person and often uh, from culture to culture. Okay, I've got a couple questions I'd like to ask everybody. These are just uh, opinion questions so we can collect some interesting information about what you think about privacy. And this, these questions, I'm only talking about geographical location. That is, how do you care that somebody knows where in the world you are? You care if somebody knows you're sitting in Graham 208 now or wherever you are. Are you out at the bar? Are you out at work? Are you walking down the street? They want to, can somebody find out where you are? How concerned are you of that? So let's, let's go out there and start the poll. Okay. Okay. Uh, anybody have a chance to click on this? It's it's again. It's not a question. Of what you, it's your personal opinion? All right. The results. Uh, it's difficult to show the results on the screen, but they can see them online. Uh, there were of the. People here. Uh, there were about. One person who is very concerned that your friends can always know. Most people are somewhat concerned. About half, slightly more than half the people selected that they were somewhat concerned. About a quarter of the people said they were somewhat unconcerned and about 15, 20% said they were not concerned at all. Okay, so let's stop that and go to the next question, maybe. There we are. All right, there's the next question. Not your friends, but corporations, Amazon, Google, big company. How about them? Hey, we're looking for a few more people online to give us their opinion. Again, it's just your opinion. What do you think? We're just going to kind of collect that and see what people think about this. Okay. But we're pretty much evenly uh, tied. In, in class, in the class here, uh, more people were very concerned and online people were somewhat concerned. And it breaks out to about 50-50. People are very concerned, somewhat concerned. Nobody clicked somewhat unconcerned and nobody selected not at all concerned. So I guess to companies like Google, you are much more concerned. Some people, uh, again, a quarter of them, oh gee, maybe more, were happy to have your friends know and only your selected friends. And I have one last opinion question coming up here. Okay, let's try this one. I've changed it now to the government. How, how concerned are you that the government 
always knows where you are. And we'll make it easy for assume all layers of government, state, federal, any agency of the, of the government. Okay, uh, anybody else online want to give us their opinion? That's another one. Okay. The results are quite similar to companies. The co people have the same concerns as companies like Google and Amazon as the government. Uh, they're pretty much evenly divided between very concerned and somewhat concerned. So you'll note that people are relatively happy to have their friends and again, selected friends know where they are. And there are websites or, or apps that will tell you where your friends are. You can sign up. I think goes at four squares, one of them where you can say, I am here, and all your friends know that you are there and they can meet you if they want to. Uh, apparently, people do not want to meet up with the federal government in some place. They just assume they not know. So, most people would. So, very concerned or at least somewhat concerned that the government knows where you are all the time. Two years ago, I had a graduate student working on phone app that would keep track of, of where you were and allow it to be known only to your selected friends. That would be the first question. And I gave a survey to a bunch of people, students, friends, church members, anybody I could get to answer the survey. And one of the questions was the one we just saw, how concerned are you that your friends know where you are or, and, that, and that others know where you are? Well, there was a very strong correlation between people's concern about location privacy and their age. Uh, students, meaning, well, I had to ask people over 18 because this is a university approved research project. And I'll tell you, you never want to mess with children under 18 if you're doing a research project because the, uh, anyway, the, the people who have to approve your research will never let it go. So, everybody was pretty 18. So the, uh, and we talk about students, usually 18 to 20, you know, low 20s with students, and then a bunch of old farts that I, about my age, who I asked, very strong correlation with age. The older people did not want anybody to know where they were, whereas the younger people were happy to have everybody know where you were. So again, it's culturally trendy. I don't know why old people don't want you to know where they are. Uh, I'm teaching security for a long time. I'm not paranoid about anybody knowing anything. So. All right. Uh, of course, there are organizations keeping track of where you are. Your, phone, your cell phone carrier must know where you are in order for you to receive a call. In other words, if, if I call you, the phone company has to know on what tower we can connect to your phone because there are thousands, probably hundreds, hundreds of thousands of towers in this country and your request to, for you to get a phone call only goes over one of them, the one that you are connected to. And so the phone company has to have some vague concept. They have to know that you are within distance of this tower. So that gives a rough concept. In fact, they can be a little bit more because you may be in some distance between multiple towers and they can say, oh, this signal strength is this, level to this tower and that level to that tower, and they can make a guess that you're in a couple of positions. So they have to know. Some applications keep track of where you are. They have GPS and they report back to headquarters where you are. They seem to feel that that's an advantage to you. It's an advantage to them. They try to make it look like an advantage to you. Uh, again, the ad is if you walk past uh, Tony's Pizza, all of a sudden, Advertisements for Tony's Pizza may show up on your phone or a discount coupon for Tony's Pizza trying to lure you in because they know you're there. Hmm. 
again, from Wikipedia, privacy concern exists wherever uniquely identifiable data relating to a person or persons are collected and stored in a digital form or otherwise. So we have all sorts of information out there. And well, many people are willing to give up certain information, certain features. Again, some people want everybody to know where they are. Some people would like the companies to know that I'm walking past the pizza store so they can send me ads. Others would just assume they not. The United Nations has a universal declaration of human rights. It's been out there for a while. This picture, that's Eleanor Roosevelt looking at this. She was the first lady, uh, President Roosevelt. So that's been a few decades, maybe 60 years or so. Uh, but it also indicates that no one should be subject to arbitrary interference with his privacy, etc. cetera. Uh, so many people believed that privacy was a part of your human rights. Now, the fourth, here's the Fourth Amendment of the US Constitution which basically protects you against unreasonable search and seizure. There is the exact copy of it. Uh, but you can see, uh, right, people will be secure in the homes against unreasonable searches. Well, by the way, for those who are not uh, US citizens or heard about this, the Constitution was created at all late 18th century, 1790s or so. Oh boy, so I, I should know this. I got through, you know, the, I got through grade school. <laughs> it's been a long time. But the first 10 amendments of the Constitution were known as the Bill of Rights. And it was they were passed almost immediately after the Constitution. And they provide uh, several rights, including this one, which is the government can't go out. And remember, that was shortly after the Revolutionary War. And so there were several things that they were upset about the previous uh, government, the king of England, when they were, could do all sorts of things. King of England could go in and search anything you want, search your house at any time. And they said, nope, that's not allowed. I have a little bit on telephones here because the rights of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the your right of privacy in the phone system has changed over the years. Long ago, people had telephones with the little crank on the side, and no dial or push buttons. When you wanted to make a call, you turn the crank. You turn the crank, generate uh, power to generator. The generator rang up, made electricity to rang a bell in the central office where a human, a phone operator, would answer. You would tell the human being to whom you wish to connect, and they would take the wire that connects to your phone and connect it to the line where you want to connect, and then their phone would ring. But the operator could listen in. In fact, sometimes had to listen in to make sure, in fact, you've got a connection. They connect you, listen until it, like somebody, somebody answered, and then, in theory, they hung up. But it wasn't required. It didn't have to hang up, particularly if you made a long-distance phone call. They had to go through several operators, and operators would talk to operators, telling what you were, and you'd have to get there. And sometimes there would be uh, collect calls where somebody... Would want, I'd want to call you, but I want you to pay for it. So the operator would have to ask if you were willing to accept the call, the charges for the phone call. And if you said yes, let's go. If you didn't say yes, well, too bad. Didn't do it. Okay, but we had a human being involved in the loop, and they may or may not. And of course, in small towns, the operators knew everything. Interesting uh, ad here. In 1920s, they invented the dial phone. This phone has a dial, and you could call other numbers. You didn't require the operator, and that improved privacy. The operators weren't involved, and essentially, this ad touts the importance of using a dial phone so that you have privacy that nobody owns me. And again, dial phones came in in 1919. This is a dial exchange. Dial phones, as you dialed the number, you moved your finger around it, and then it moved back to click, 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 click. As it moved back, it connected and disconnected the signal. So was, you could do the same thing. You can actually 
quote, dial. If you take the phone off, the receiver off the hook and press the number, if you want to go, tee, 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 you could dial three, tee, tee. It, it was difficult to do correctly, but it didn't work. Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting to note that, of course, because the dial goes around, that small numbers were faster than long numbers. So you, it was easier to dial small numbers. So the area codes, the area code for New York City is 212. And since one's a special number, uh, area codes cannot start with one or zero. Two is the first one. So 212 is about the smallest number you're going to have. And so that was easiest. And of course, they put that in New York City. I might note, I lived in an area that had a dial code, or area code of 908. So <laughs> we're in the middle of nowhere. Nobody wanted to call us. Okay. And somewhere in the 60s, uh, dial, uh, push button phones came out. I do remember being an old guy going to the New York World's Fair in the early 60s as a child. And they, and the phone company was there touting the wonders of push button phones and how much faster it was for you. And of course, easier for them. You see. When you press the button on the push button phone, it creates a tone, sinusoidal tone. And the phone company switching equipment receives that tone, recognizes what button you pressed, and uses that as the next number that you press. Now, the, the tone went over the same connection that your voice does. It was simply, you know, the phone button pad had just a bunch of tone generators. But it turns out you could make those tones by other ways. You didn't have to use the phone companies. And, and people could steal from the phone company or uh, <clears throat> do things to fool the phone company's equipment by putting tones on the phone that had some control sound, tones that were not generated by your phone. There was none of the was 12 buttons on your phone generated this tone, but there were other tones the phone's company used to signal to other systems. It turns out that a 2400 hertz tone, that's a, you can see four three above the middle C. It's, it's, a, it's a sound that you can easily hear. If you put that sound across the phone line, it disconnected the call. But because you didn't hang up, it really didn't stop the call. That, that tone was generated by a little plastic whistle that came in the box of Captain Crunch cereal. And so there were lots of them out there, and it quickly became known by everybody who wanted to do this sort of stuff, that if you got yourself a Captain Crunch whistle and you blew it into the phone, you could control how the phone operated. Uh, and people built what we call blue boxes, blue by the way, uh, that created these calls and you could cheat on the phone, uh, making phone calls. You could press the button on the blue box and it would generate the tone into the, and control calling without having to pay for it. And at that time, people paid for long distance phone. Nowadays, on your cell phone, you can call across the street or you can call across the country. It's all the same price. You don't pay extra for long distance. Once upon a time, you paid a lot for long distance. I, I mean, dollars per minute kind of charge on long distance. And those were the days when a dollar was a lot of money. So you, it could be quite expensive to call long distance, uh, but you could cheat with this. Phone company did not like this at all. They switched it. They changed, first of all, they did what's called out of band signaling. They took the signaling signal out of the signal channel on which people talked and put it into a special control channel so that only the phone company could send control images over that. Uh, they changed your phone so that you have rows and columns of your buttons. There's four rows, three columns is displayed. And the signal that's sent is a combination of that column signal and the row signal. It's a little bit more complex. Of course, <laughs> the hackers became more complex too. And in the 80s, they moved to It is uh, legal to record a phone company if you consent to, or one side consents to the recording. It is illegal to record a phone company in the United States and in North Carolina, if uh, a third party is, in other words, if I call you, if you want to record it, that's okay. 
I want to record it, that's okay. If somebody else wants to record it, that's not okay. Uh, yes, question. Yes. Oh, so in other words, if I'm talking to you, a third party who we make who we in general do not even know exists or know is on the gun, they can't record it. Basically, what it means is somebody cannot tap your phone. Somebody cannot record. Uh, secretly record your phone conversations without your knowledge. Now, of course, you have probably called some place that tells you in the beginning that this phone call is recorded for quality and training purposes. You hear that all the time. I don't really believe it's recorded for quality and training purposes. Is that a question? Yes, question. Get, okay, can the government record your conversations? Why? That's a good question. Uh, Yes, the government can do so if and only if they have a warrant. So again, the fourth, uh, fourth Amendment to the Constitution is called unreasonable search and seizures. And that has been interpreted to mean by many courts for many, many years that they cannot record uh, conversations on your phone unless they have a warrant. So the government can't do that. Yes. Yes, if the government does record, again, they're doing that illegally, and you can take legal action against the government. Uh, hang on for a second. Uh, it's interesting to note that if you're calling on a business telephone, and if you're at work and you're calling on a business telephone, say uh, you are calling uh, Fred, who's down the hall, and talking to them in the same company, your employer is allowed to record the conversation without your acknowledgement on the, the basis that it's their phone system, you're working for them at the time, and they have the right to know what's going on. Uh, whether you like it or not, that's the way the, the law works. Okay, so if you uh, do a phone company, somebody has to, you have to approve it. Uh, and you, I believe you have to inform the other side that you, have, that you are recording the conversation. That's why they always say this call is recorded for quality and training purposes. And I believe it's for much more than quality of care. Somebody actually told me it's recorded for accuracy. Yeah, accuracy. They want to make sure that if they give you any information that you later claim, well, she called, I called and she told me. Well, did she tell you or not? They're going to go back and look at that recording and find out whether she did say that. Uh, uh, and again, uh, wire, government wiretapping, wiretapping by anybody, not just the government. But if I go out and tap your phone line and listen to what you're saying, that is against the law. Uh, private detectives cannot do this ever. They cannot listen to your uh, phone conversations. Of course, in the movies they do it all the time, but it's against law. Yes, question. So, let's say I'm having a conversation. I'm recording it. I'm recording it. I believe you do, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, it varies from state to state. I know in other states where I've lived, that was a requirement that you had to tell the other person that's recording it, which is part of the reason why you get the message, this recording, this phone call is recorded for quality assurance. So it doesn't matter why they're recording it, but they're telling you it's being recorded and that fulfills their obligation. Particularly if they happen to be calling, even if it's not a requirement in your state, if you're calling somebody in another state, maybe. Okay, again, wiretapping is against the law. Yes, good question. Sorry. Oh, okay, you were just walking here, and in your pocket you have a record. I do not know. That's a very interesting question. Anybody? Uh, okay. There was a question that said, if we are talking not over a phone, but simply I am talking to you uh, standing in the same room and I have a recording device in my pocket, is that allowable? Assuming I do not tell you about it. i not sure. I kind of think maybe that if you use, you're not allowed to use that data in a court case. But other than that, it might be okay. I'll tell you, there have been times when I wanted to have that recorded, I wish I could. But you said, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. I, I'd like to have a recording of that. Oh, 
Okay, so uh, way back 86, uh, laws against wiretapping. I might note that the phone companies are required to provide a feature for the government to record your phone calls if they have a warrant. In other words, if the FBI decides they want to listen to your phone calls and they get a warrant from the judge, then the phone companies have to provide the ability to do that, which several years ago, uh, back in 86, phone companies weren't wild about that. They didn't like to have to provide this service. It was Otherwise, it was much easier to build the phone switches if they didn't have to. Oh, yes, if this person calls somebody, in addition to uh, connecting it, you have to provide, provide a recording of it. They, they didn't want to do that, but they had to do that. Government said that's a requirement. Yes, another question. Oh, you, the question is, can you ask the phone company if the government is recording your phone conversation? I have no idea. That's an interesting question. Um, I would just, off the top of my head, think that if they have a warrant to tap your phone, then they want it to remain secret. They do not want to tell anybody, I'm pretty sure that the phone company is obligated to keep that secret because if the FBI got a warrant to tap your phone and they were tapping your phone, they don't want their phone company to go out and say, oh, your phone's being tapped. I might point out that to get a warrant, the government has to provide probable cause that this is necessary. They have to say that they're going to, exactly who they're going to record. They want to tap this phone, not all everybody's phone, they record this phone and they have this reason that they think this is important and at least make it sound good to a judge so that the judge will authorize it. Good question. Yes. And come to that, I don't know the answers to multiple of these questions, but they are interesting questions for privacy. Now, back in 2001, oh, that's 22 years ago, probably before many of you were born, but uh, that was shortly after the 9-11 event and the U.S. got very concerned, so they passed the Patriot Act, which well, we won't go into why it's named the Patriot Act, but they made it easier for the government to uh, do wiretaps. They reduced the requirements. Uh, that act has expired now, and so the requirements have gone back. Particularly interesting at that time, they could track the metadata of calls to, to outside the United States. So every call that was originated or went to someplace outside the United States, they can keep track of, they didn't record all the, the conversations, but they record that you made a call at this time to this place. Kind of like you might see in your phone bill, uh, where you called, when you called, how long, the government can get all that information from anybody, any times you called outside the United States, because they were concerned about terrorists calling home and talking to dad or something, I'm not sure. Okay. The U.S. Constitution does not explicitly give you a right to privacy. It does, of course, say you are protected against unreasonable search and seizures, uh, but it doesn't explicitly say it. But the, the Constitution, excuse me, Supreme Court, who in the United States rules on the constitutionality of particular laws, has pretty much decided that you have some freedom from government intrusion. You have some liability of privacy. How that you know, that varies from time to time. Uh, there are different types of privacy, um, financial, medical, political, internet. Uh, you may want to keep some of this private. Identity theft is when somebody gets information about you, enough information that they can convince a third party that they are you. And the typical thing is that they'll uh, get a credit card out in your nest, so you get some sort of financial uh, statement in your name. Open a credit card, uh, open a bank account, spend some money somewhere saying that they are you, hoping to leave you with the bill. That typically requires them to know your name, address, because your name and address, is, you can find that in the phone book or elect electronic version of your phone book. They often want to know other information that you ought to try to keep uh, you want to try to keep secret, private. But uh, there is a whole business of 
finding out the information about people and selling it on the web so that other people can steal credit card information for you and pose that they're you. There are several laws in the United States that protect your privacy. Uh, the HIPAA, the Health Insurance Privacy and Accountability Act, has a lot of requirements about how health information is kept about a person. That'll be, we'll cover that in more detail. The Children's Online Privacy Act says for children, children under the age of 13, there's all sorts of requirements what they have to do. And then the fair and accurate credit reporting. I think we'll go over those in some more detail. Oh. Let's just skip this one right now. I think I just told you, can you, you tell me two slides ago, did you forget already? The answer to this one's no, there's no real constitutional right to privacy, but the Supreme Court has ruled that there is a certain level of privacy that you're required because of some of the other ones, particularly the Fourth Amendment. So the Constitution, the basic laws do not say, yes, you have a right to privacy, well, I think some of our laws would be different if you did. Without getting political at all. But if you had a right to privacy, how would that impact the abortion laws? Hmm, it would be different. Okay. Uh, HIPAA. HIPAA is the health care law. It came out oh, almost 30 years ago, maybe 25, 30 years ago. It does several things. It has many rules on protections, but it also formatted certain data. It said, let's put your healthcare data into this format, an interoperable format. Before this, oh, sure, people had all sorts of digital values of your, your health information, but it was all different. Everybody stored it differently. And it was very difficult for the doctor's office to pass the information to the insurance company to pass it to a, another doctor. But HIPAA said, we're going to put it in this format so you can pass it between doctor's offices and health insurance companies. And you don't have to be too old, like me, to remember the days when you, in the back of the doctor's office, they had huge, five, many, many shelves of paper records about each pace, patient. That they said, you said something, the doctor would write it down and they put it into your folder. And when you came in, the uh, staff would go back look through the long folder files, find your folders and give it to the doctor. Um, now, now when I go to talk to my doctor, he just brings his laptop in, reviews my records there, says a few things like, oh, you're gonna need one of these tests coming up. I'm going, oh, uh, I'm gonna need one of those tests. But, so he knows what I need and he can make entries as a recommendations and, and order tests from the right online, and it goes to other places smoothly. Um, it did several healthcare coverage and standards, okay. It also defined privacy limitations. There's significant privacy regulations on your healthcare information, much more, I believe, than almost any other aspect of your life. The information that they have on your healthcare must be encrypted. Uh, and again, I mentioned electronic formats. You have the right to, to review your protected health information and update it as necessary. Uh, there are administrative requirements, physical, they have to keep this stuff locked up. Uh, and all sorts of regular security, they have to keep it encrypted. And anytime it's transmitted from one place to another, it has to be encrypted. So they, they use encryption, they use strong encryption, and lots of rules for keeping it secure. The uh, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, uh, again, it's for kids 12 and under. That's why when you go to a website, it may say, you have you know click here to indicate that you are 13 and older because they don't want to have to deal with this rule. It gets some too, because obviously a kid who's uh, 11 years old and wants to go to this website, he's gonna click the button and say, oh yeah, I'm old. Particularly since there's almost nothing you can do about that to the kid. You can't sue the kid. You can't drag him off to jail. Uh, so they do that. They can get your parents into difficulty. Uh, and so it, it is difficult to get that done. If you have a child, if you collect any information, now if you go to a website that just has fun and games for children and doesn't ever collect any information about it, that's okay. But if you want like just their name, if you want them to log in, that 
is collecting information about them, and parents need to be involved. And that's why a lot of places don't want to bother. They just say, no, go away, kids. Uh, fair and accurate credit. This is make sure that uh, the credit reports are open because before the fair and accurate credit laws, people kept track of your credit rating, but they didn't tell you what it was. And you couldn't find out uh, if people had inaccurate information, you couldn't uh, object to it, you couldn't correct it. Now it is required that you be able to correct that. Well, little things too, like you, when you go out and buy something, when you look on your receipts, when you go spend some money with your credit card, if you go to a restaurant or something, they only print the last five digits of your credit card. That's because they used to print all the digits of your credit card. And anybody who got the receipt goes, oh, I know their credit card number now. So they don't do that anymore. All right. Companies need to keep your information private. Employers need to keep the information about their employees private. Although, again, there's very little privacy that the employee has about the employer. The employer can keep track of all sorts of things that the employee does, particularly at work. What are you doing? In fact, many companies now watch what you do on social media. So even though you might be doing something on social media on your own time at home, employers may look at that. Companies have secrets. Some companies, all they have, their entire value of that company is that they have a secret. They may know the, the source code to this application. They have that secret. That is a trade secret. They are allowed to protect that trade secret through all sorts of ways. And almost all states provide laws to help you protect that trade secret. And laws, in case somebody tries to break in and get that secret, then you can sue them using those laws. Um, a, lot of time, a lot of times we have these home assistants, Siri, Alexa, you can say, Alexa, do this. And if you have one of those little devices, it pays attention and will do. Uh, friend, I, I, I keep my shopping list on a piece of paper stuck to the refrigerator on a magnet. Everybody writes on that. People say, well, you could just go, Alexa, put carrots on the shopping list, which you can do, and that works just fine. I don't do that because I'm really paranoid, and I don't allow Alexa to my house. Uh, Although every now and again, I wonder, whoa, what is going on? Okay, time out for a minute. I got to tell you a story about secrecy. A couple months ago, my son changed uh, his bank account. He decided to get a different, his bank wasn't treating well. He was going to go to a different bank. So he signed on to get electronic banking. And when he first signed up and said, he's this name, and they asked, well, I want to make sure that you really are David Williams. So let me ask, they said, we're going to ask you a few questions. The first question was, in what city does Amanda Smith live in? That's my daughter, his sister. She hasn't lived at my house for over 15 years. How did they know that she was his sister and that he would know where she lives? Ah, uh, yes. That, uh, that one shocked me. They went on to ask a couple other questions, which uh, they may have known, but the one about his sister really got me. They, the bank knew that. The bank knew that his sister, with a different name, hasn't been at our house for 15 years, except the visit. Uh, he would probably know where she lived. And they had a multiple choice, and the city where she lives was a right there in the multiple choice. So they knew and he knew. They also asked who's so-and-so and we had no idea who that so-and-so was. Anyway, so talking about privacy, there ain't any. Yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, online. Um, yes, the question was that, that a human being involved. No, a human being was not involved in generating that question. That question came their computer system, which probably uses AI to some sense, depending on what you call AI, uh, that they generated that question electronically. So they knew they had databases that they could pick up and look at. She doesn't even bank in the same bank that 
My son was trying to get an account. Boy, they knew things that I did. No idea they'd know. So, uh, and well, these home assistants are listening out there. They now, of course, come with video. You don't feel like just talking to it. You can have a video. You can connect to other people. Uh, Alexa, connect to Fred, and it will show connect to Fred, and Fred can talk to you and look at it. There's a whole bunch of those out there. Now, Amazon Echo. I went out and looked at the Amazon Echo, which is one, one of many systems that do this. You know, advertising this, Amazon gives a lot of information about how their system works. They look for keywords. Amazon has, they call their device Alexa. So if you go Alexa, you say the keyword and the system is searching for the keyword. So all the time it's searching for the keyword. Only when you search the keyword does it start doing something. So you have to say Alexa, put carrots on the shopping list. But you have to say Alexa first, unless you turn it into conversational mode. It has conversational mode. And you can say Alexa, turn on conversational mode. In which case you can have a conversation with Alexa and maybe others. And Alexa will listen to everything and chime in as it sees appropriate. Uh, how does it work technically since this is a computer science class? Uh, when you say the wake word, which is Alexa by default or Siri for other systems, then it's, it starts listening. So it's, it's listening all the time. It's looking for the magic word. When it sees the magic word, then it starts recording what you say. It records what you say, ships it off, to Amazon servers in an encrypted manner. The server on Amazon does a speech to text conversion. So it figures out what did you say, uh, does some natural language understanding. And okay, now that it's got a series of words that you said, what does that mean? What does it want you to do? Did, were you asking it to look up information? You can say, Alexa, what's the weather going to be tomorrow? And that means it's going to have to go out to some weather prediction site and get that information and present it. Or if you say put carrots in the shopping list, it just means open up uh, a list that you have created and add the word carrots to it. When it figures out what it is, then it might involve the search and do a search engine uh, search on that. When it finally gets an answer, when it gets the search results, puts them back into an English summary, and then it does a text to speech and sends that back to Alexa, who speaks back to you. And if you've done this, it does this all in a second or two. And then you say, Alexa, what's the weather going to be tomorrow? And it chimes in very quickly what it's going to be. Uh, there are other things that do uh, detection. They, they detect motion. They have motion sensors or, or using ultrasonic. Uh, yes, uh, you may have lights that turn on when you walk in the room or walk in in the garage or something in terms of light, and they can detect motion, and that can be convenient. People have doorbells, well, they call them doorbell systems, but doorbell systems that have cameras, and they usually only go active when there's motion in front of the system. I looked up this little Amazon Astro, the household robot for home monitoring, and it looks like this. It has cameras and microphones, a periscope camera that looks around <laughs> and it will wander around your home. It's mobile. If it hears something, it will go look and see if there's any trouble. Uh, you can do conversations with it, talking there. You can connect with it via your phone and ask it something. The example they give on the website is uh, go to the kitchen and check and see if the if the oven is turned on and it'll add a little device rolls into the kitchen, periscope goes up, looks at the dial for the oven and says, ah, it is or is not on. Kind of interesting. So, what are we doing for time? Oh, let's try this one, see if everybody's awake. Oh, where is that poll?
All right. Uh, hey, hey, folks out there online, wake up. Question. You know, it's easier to fall asleep when you're out there wherever you are. Okay, we'll just go with what we got. All right, the online and the in-person class uh, selected about the same thing. Everybody, most people said interprets only what is said after the wake word. And that is usually the mode of operation, unless you turn on conversation mode, in which case you'll interpret everything you say, which is C. It's not supposed to be recording everything you say, A. Many people are suspicious that Alexa is listening in, that, that Amazon is listening to everything you say, but that is not the case. Uh, at least that is not what they tell us is the case. The answer I think would be uh, B or C are both good, good answers. Uh, B, unless you turn it on, then it will be C. If you turn on conversation mode, it listens to everything. Although I'm always wondering, I, I don't have a Alexa device in my kitchen, but the other day the cheese, cheese slicer broke while we were using it. And that afternoon, Amazon said, hey, you want to buy a cheese slicer? How did you know? Maybe just sold me a cheese slicer uh, a year ago that has two year estimated lifetime that knew who I wanted. Anyway, yeah, it, that was interesting. Okay. <clears throat> it's interesting that Amazon has a bug bounty. That is, they'll pay you to find problems and fix it if you find a new bug, depending on how bad the bug is. If you're finding it, a bug doesn't cause much trouble. They only give you 150 bucks. You can go out there and make some money, find a really serious bug. You know, that's not like $10,000 is serious money. I think before we've talked about the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, that uh, addresses the company's ability to keep private or personally identifiable information about you. And if they do that, they have to. You have to inform them again. You have to be able to look at what they have, update it, and correct it as necessary. And they cannot collect information without your explicit or uh, explicitly allowing it. It said uh, California has a very similar bill. The rest of the United States generally doesn't. I think I mentioned this. You again uh, has to disclose what they collect ask for your permission, state how long they're going to keep it and what they're going to do with it. Are they going to give it to anybody? Are they going to sell this information to anyone? And you probably looked at, oh, you may, actually, you probably haven't. If you do look at privacy statements that all the companies provide, you will see that they very carefully indicate what they are going to do with the data that they collect. And can you change that? Some data they're going to collect and they're going to use it a certain way, and there's nothing you can do about it. That's not allowed. Other data they collect, and if they want, you, they will delete it, but only if, you, only if you ask. And again, people have the right under the GDPR to look at the data you have. They can be, make it anonymous. And You've seen these laws in action because many websites now, almost every website that uses cookies, we've talked about cookies before. When you go to the website, a message pops up and says, uh, can you use cookies, accept the use of cookies? And you have to click there to say you're going to use cookies, or you may look at the cookie options. I'll use required cookies or functional cookies or performance cookies or tracking cookies or advertising cookies. And you can say which cookies you want to look at. I've noticed that many of the websites that gives the option of manage cookies besides saying, if you say yes, I'll accept cookies before you do anything, then you get off. If you go manage, many of them go, oh, they're concerned and they only turn on the required cookies. They just, ah, if they're gonna go manage it, they're not gonna look at, they don't want the other ones on. So they just turn them off, they turn them back on, but they by default turn off. Systems have to be um, created with security in mind. They should default to the highest level of security. If you want less security, you can loosen it up. Companies, of course, are very concerned about keeping data and they have to tell you what data is, they have to encrypt it. All right, P 
people have been concerned about being watched on the web, people knowing what sites you're going to, that the websites can keep track of who you are, where you are. They know the internet address where you came from. That it can be connected to your home. So people are concerned about this. They formed uh, systems to keep the information private. There's the dark web. Now, uh, they have three levels of web I've been seen to find. The surface web is like Wikipedia and Google. Everybody knows it's there. Everybody can go to it. Uh, Amazon, everybody. And then there's the deep web. The deep web is where you have to have permission to go to that website. The websites where you have to log in. All sorts of ones here. Uh, academic information. Blackboard. Blackboard would be part of the deep web. You have to log in if you are don't have a user ID and password for Blackboard. You cannot log in and see the assignment I put out there for this class. You only see it if you connect. And then the dark web. The dark web keeps more secrets. There is the onion routing system that allows you to look at things. The onion routing system is generally talking about onion. They use the dot onion router, T O R, the Tor software to the sort of software and Tor software encrypts everything multiple times to hide who you are and where you're going. And so if somebody's looking at the line along the way, say you're using the Tor browser, Tor system, uh, and a coffee shop and somebody's watching you in the Wi-Fi because you don't have Wi-Fi security. They might know where you're going. With Tor, they haven't a clue where you're going. Excuse me? Tor, yeah. Yes, I'll go over it in a little bit more here. Okay, how does it do this? Let me explain how the onion routing, onion routing, which by the way, onion routing was developed by the US Navy to allow uh, naval intelligence people to send things back home or to other places without anybody knowing about it. They don't know where you connected. They don't know what you sent. Nothing is recorded. It's a series of routers. So typically things are only routed from, one, from my computer to your server. Oh, there are maybe multiple network routers that don't look at anything at all. Things just, you know, bits come in, bits go out. That's all they do. They don't look at anything. Uh, on your routers, oh yes, they come in and they decrypt and re-encrypt re -encrypt the information through multiple layers of encryption. All the, all the routers have encryptors. And they create a virtual circuit through a layer of router or a series of routers. This might explain it a little bit more. Each router has a public key. We're using a public key encryption, asymmetric encryption. Every router has a public key. The message is routed from series of routers, each with a product key. And so, okay, imagine you are going to send it to layer, your layer one. You're going to send the information and you encrypt this with the public key of the first router. When the first router gets it, it decrypts it and looks at where is it supposed to send it? Where is the next router this is supposed to go? It then encrypts it with the public key of the second router and ships it off to the second router. The third router gets it and it goes, oh, where is this supposed to go? And it uh, encrypts, it, of course, decrypts it with what it received and encrypts it again with the key. Of it. Eventually, it gets there. The okay, so <clears throat> the beginning router knows who you are. The last router knows where it's going. In other words, if you send something to acme.com, and they're not called acme.com, by the way, uh, that the last router knows that something is going to acme.com. The first router knows that you're sending something, but it doesn't know where, because what you're going to, where it's going, is all encrypted in keys that it doesn't have. So only the first one, and all the middle ones just send things on, and so nobody knows where this message is going. Exactly. The purpose is to make it untraceable and, und and unknown. And somebody, if somebody was to tap the line, they would just see bits going across. Oh, they'd see that a message is coming from this computer to that computer. 
but they wouldn't know where it goes after that because they, because the link is encrypted and then it's encrypted by another key where it goes after that. So the Tor browser is available on www.torproject.org or the download. It's available for Windows, Apple systems, uh, Linux, and it's also available for Android phones. Yeah, you got an app that's on Android phones. Uh, there's an assignment out the last assignment, maybe not last, the latest assignment on this class, which is now on Blackboard, requires you to go out and look on the dark web. Okay. So you'll have to go there and download it on your system. There are other systems besides uh, Tor for security. There's a Hunix. You've got Unix. This is Hunix. Hunix is a version of Linux that has been updated for security, and it's an effort to keep maximum security. Everything that goes out goes across the Onion routing system, the dark web. It doesn't keep any personal information. It doesn't reveal any personal information. We have looked at the headers for HTTP when you send the HTTP header tells a lot about where you, it tells what operating system you're on, a bunch of information like that. But I can tell you when you use Hunix, it doesn't tell that information. It doesn't tell me anything. And Hunix is a version of Linux that's been updated. It runs inside a virtual machine. You can get Hunix to run on your Windows or your Apple system. You just load it. it runs like an application on these systems. You just start it up. And then inside that virtual machine, you run a browser and you can look uh, be, and be secure. It doesn't keep track of any, doesn't reveal anything. And there are other versions of this that you have to boot up as an operating system. Which you'd write, typically you'd write them to a thumb drive and then boot up that thumb drive to a separate operating system and it would keep everything secret. Okay. For the assignment that I'll mention in just a minute, that you have to go, you have to go out to the dark web and look at some stuff. Be careful. Don't be stupid. The dark web has a lot of stuff. I've been out there looking around and just like you might think, yes, they're selling weapons. They're selling drugs. They're selling a lot of fake IDs. There's, you, oh, if you uh, wanna know somebody's social security number, it's for sale out on the dark web. Um, if you want to buy information so that you can do identity theft, that information is out of the dark web. Don't do that. It's against the law. Don't do anything that will get you in trouble. Watch out that not all these websites are uh, safe. This is not Sunday school software we're talking about here. This is dangerous stuff. Be sensible. Just because there's a website that says they sell drugs doesn't mean you should buy the drugs. Buying the drugs, remember, is still illegal. Uh, so don't get yourself in trouble. I might mention that this uh, lecture is being recorded, and I have told you in the recorded lecture, don't do anything stupid. But you will have to go out to the dark web, go to a uh, discussion forum, and find out the information that I posted there, and put that back on Blackboard so I know that you've been there. Uh, I always like this uh, quote by Benjamin Franklin. They who give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty or safety. And again, there is an assignment. It is due Monday, a week from Monday, that's the 27th. And there's only three questions. The first question is, send me a phishing email. Make it look good. Too. I, want, I want something that's convincing. I want something and I look at that email. Oh, yes, I forgot to put it down. It has to say uh, phishing in the subject. Don't put anything. It must say phishing in the subject because I have an automatic rule in my email system that if the subject says phishing, I put it over in a folder, which I will then review to see if you actually did it. Otherwise it gets mixed up in all the rest of my email and I may not find it. You must put the word phishing, P-H-I-S-I-N-G. Yes, question. Not now, but as soon as I get home, I'm gonna update that. Yes, put it out there. Must say phishing, it just, it makes it easy in my system. So since you're emailing me, and I get email all sorts of stuff, I don't want it to go into my trash. I don't want it to go someplace else. I want I want to be able to have it automatically directed into a folder. So then I can look at the folder and say, oh yes, 
uh, I can see that everybody has sent the email to me. I can review it, make sure it's correct. So put the word phishing in there. I will update the assignment as soon as I get home and do that. Pretty much put that there. Let's do. Oh, uh, the second one's about integer overflow. And the third one is a requirement to go out to a particular website on the dark web. And I, as far as I can tell, this website is not available on the open web. Many of the websites I found on the dark web also exist on the open web. They're just copies out of them. If you don't want anybody to know you're going there. But I noticed the CIA has a website out there. They're, if you go to CIA.gov, you can see the same thing on, oh, URLs on the dark web are not words, they're not acme.com. They're long strings of letters and numbers that usually dot onion that are used out there. Okay, again, today we talked about privacy. Uh, next Monday is online only. So the people who come and watch here in Gram 208 will have to watch online or via YouTube. And I'll talk about the artificial intelligence impact on cybersecurity, both good and bad. Uh, maybe some other topics because I'm struggling to figure that out. A week from today is Wednesday before Thanksgiving. The Wednesday before Thanksgiving is a holiday at a and as is the Friday after Thanksgiving. No classes at all, including no, this class will not be there. Uh, two weeks from today, there is an exam in this class. Again, it'll be an all op open all day, start at 6 a.m. Shouldn't take you 18 hours to do. We'll have a review for it the class period before that. So that's it. Are there any questions about the course, about what we said today, about the assignment? Again, the assignment requires you to go out to the dark web. Learn what the dark web is. Look around. Be careful. There are people selling things that you should not buy. Don't endanger yourself. Just because it's on the dark web doesn't mean Big Brother isn't watching. Uh, if I, remember the Navy created this, if I was the federal government or any government, I'd make myself a few Tor routers just because I, you know, and don't tell anybody, they're just Tor routers. And I'd watch. And so if things were going along the Tor routers, I'd know. Yes, with a question. Um, I'm looking at the assignment. Yes. Yes, uh, the crypt website CryptVB is uh, can be found on the dark web. Uh, oh, maybe I'll be nice and give you the URL to that. I went to oh yes, thehiddenwiki.com uh, has links to several sites, including ChatDB. Uh, there's a version of that on uh, the dark web. And it's probably better to look at it on the dark web. Just go to the first thing, search for the hidden wiki. Don't put the dot com. And also, at times, a Tor browser will ask you, do you want to look at this on onion routing or open web? Click onion routing. That's our purpose here. Also, when you download the Tor browser and start it for the first time, you have to go through make a connection. If there's a button that says make a connection, and then just Click on the button that says, well, form the connection whenever you turn it on. All right. Any more questions? Be careful. That's it for today. So uh, have fun. Don't get yourself into trouble. And I'll see you online only on Monday. Have a good evening, Dr. Williams. Yeah.